I want to start by thanking Vanessa for making it possible. This is fantastic. Uh, this is fantastic. And uh, for Wendy McGuinness and the McGuinness Institute for being a fantastic partner for the New Zealand Treasury over the last four years, what they've been doing for us is to bring the voice of New Zealand to our policy making, and in particular, the voice of young people. Uh, this has been a theme over the last four years in every policy uh, initiative that we've undertaken. We've made, used Wendy McGuinness and her institute to find incredible people from all around New Zealand, young people, and uh, ask them how this whole thing plays for them in their own age. For example, when we think about our long-term future, I say to them, I'll be long dead, um, and uh, you will be the ones who will have to deal with it, so get real and start thinking about your own futures. And the uh, other people I want to thank, of course, are all the young people, the 36 young people who participated in this um, initiative that we are doing, uh, tackling poverty in New Zealand. The uh, purpose of my 10-15 minutes is to give you a sense of why the New Zealand Treasury, which is the uh, chief economic and financial advisor for the New Zealand government, uh, should be worried or focus on poverty and related matters. And uh, the burden of my conversation and talk really is to demonstrate to you where we are coming from. And where we are coming from is uh, what we call our living standards framework, uh, which essentially says that you cannot think of a sustainable future unless you integrate economic, environmental, and social matters. If you don't think of them in an integrated, holistic, complementary way, it will take you to very bad places. By way of example, uh, South Korea, who has been obsessed with economic growth, is now coming to the OECD, which is a rich person's club of 34 countries, and saying, we've got it wrong, help us, because we've been pushing on the pedal of economic growth, but in fact is creating major issues, in their case, work-life balance. China, having grown like mad for over two, three uh, decades now, is coming to the OECD and saying we are doing something wrong, help us. In that case, what's wrong is excessive pollution, for example. So it has to be balanced, it has to be multi-dimensional, and that's what we refer to as our living standards framework. I'll talk a little bit about that. As I say to everyone, I'm so interested and excited in that that there's a diagram which hangs on my bedroom wall, and Angela, my wife, and I look at it every night, cry, and go to sleep. <laughs> and I'll show you the diagram shortly. But before then, I want to frame public policy the way the Treasury sees it. And I'm not saying we have the, we have the uh, wisdom in the world, but I just want to tell you how we think about these things, what's the mind frame in Wellington, how we are approaching these things, and then when we get around the tables, of course, we can talk about it. I'll talk about the national picture, and then when we talk about um, in the workshop, we'll also bring it to local places. And the critical issue here is there is a growing sense that, in fact, these issues cannot be solved at the center in Wellington, that the communities are where the solutions are. And the reason I'm interested in participating in these forums is because I want to hear how central government and local government communities can work together to address these so-called wicked problems. The purpose of public policy, the way we think of it, is to help people live the kinds of lives they have reason to value. And uh, we try to do this by increasing the opportunities and capabilities and the incentives of people to contribute in a meaningful way to the economy and society. In other words, there's a puzzle. On the one hand, we are saying we want to help people live the kinds of lives they have reason to value. On the other hand, we say it's none of our business as bureaucrats to tell people how to live their lives. So how do you marry the two? And we try to marry the two by saying it's all about giving people the opportunities and capabilities and incentives to live the kinds of lives they have reason to value, the rest of it is none of our business. So that's the bottom line. If you forget everything else, just think about that. 
one thing that we find is when we get from the individual freedom to live the kinds of lives you have to uh, reason to value to the sort of big picture policy is a lot of work across many cultures, societies, and throughout history has shown that the so-called domains of well-being, in other words, things that people value are common against, uh, across humanity. And they are listed there. So it includes, and I'll read it, uh, income and wealth, jobs and earnings, housing, health, work and life balance, education and skills, social connections, civic engagement and governance, environmental quality, personal security, and subjective well-being. There is very, very robust evidence to demonstrate that these are common across all kinds of cultures and societies, and that provides the flat platform for us to say, how do we frame policy in a way that addresses these issues, expands these things, and then leaves people alone to live the kinds of lives they have reason to value. This is the picture that hangs on my bedroom wall. It is very big in my bedroom wall, but not maybe here. So what it says is the following. This is the way we think and frame policy. It says that what we are trying to do is to maximize or increase intergenerational well-being. In other words, we care about well-being across society and across generations. The sources of well-being are the capital stocks, what we call comprehensive wealth, that we all share. Those capital stocks we classify under natural capital, social capital, human capital, and economic capital. You can expand it, uh, it doesn't matter, the spirit is there. In other words, well-being is multidimensional, and its sources are multidimensional. People care not only about the food they eat, but also all the other things that I listed about their health, about their security, about the environment and all that. And the sources of what they care about are what we call comprehensive well, which sit in the middle at the platform of that diagram. Then you ask the question, what can public policy possibly do to expand and protect those capital stocks? And that's where we bring those, those dimensions that we focus on from a public policy perspective. So we say we, can, we should be trying to increase the capacity of our capital to generate more income and jobs and so on. That's the material well-being. We should make sure that these capital stocks are equitably distributed across society and across time so that we don't destroy everything today at the expense of future generations. That it should be sustainable, the same kind of thing. In an increasingly diverse society, we should worry about social cohesion. In other words, we have to make sure that we need we live well together in social harmony and we give more and more and more voice to the local communities which are so diverse we cannot solve it from the center but we can support it and also resilience to major systemic risks every society has its own systemic risk in our case it could be disease imported from overseas earthquakes whatever our cyber security our job from a public policy perspective is to make sure that we increase resilience through appropriate investments to these systemic risks. So that's the way we think and frame policy at the New Zealand Treasury. The other point maybe you, should, you, you may not be able to appreciate is in addition to being a chief financial and economic advisor to the New Zealand government, the Treasury, as well, is probably the only institution in the country that can see the whole system and bring it together. So we play uh, the word catalyzer in that context. We, we try to be a catalyst for bringing these. And the Living Standards Framework is actually a very powerful tool to make that happen because it has opened a lot of conversations with the Ministry for Social Development, Ministry for the Environment, Ministry for Education. So we are saying to them we need to work together in order to tackle these problems because they cannot be tackled individually and separately. In terms of the way we define poverty, therefore, it really relates to the original point. In other words, poverty cannot be simply income poverty. Poverty relates to well-being and it relates to our ability to participate in economic and social life, which is a theme that the young people already articulated on. So it's not only about material, it's, it's a wider sense of 
uh, being able to participate and contribute. That's the way we define poverty. And when you look at it that way, there is no doubt that uh, in New Zealand, like everywhere else, there is poverty in that context. And we are talking about, when we talk about ent entrenched or enduring poverty, we are talking about 9 to 15 percent of the, of the population, depending on which age group you look at. But it is there. The more important point, however, which is a point I think Wendy made earlier, is uh, it is pointless to debate about whether it is bigger or smaller here or there. The reality is we should have no poverty. And the other point is the use of a framework is to deal with it before it happens, because usually we chase it. In other words, it's pointless to deal with poverty after it happens. If you have the right framework, then it is critical to use that framework to deal with it before it happens. And that's what we are framing in the Treasury and across the public sector. Uh, today, the words used are social investment. In other words, there is increasing data that shows us who the most vulnerable people are in the community. And the availability of that data has now raised the expectations by the government and others because we know who the poor kids are or because we can predict who the kids are who will end up in jail with a high level of probability, we can do something about it. That's not as simple as it sounds. The fact that I know in which district, in which particular house a poor kid or a vulnerable kid lives does not automatically provide a solution which is multidimensional. And therefore, there's a lot of work to be done on the solution, but we have a, a whole group of people in the center who now, with the data available, are able to analyze the data and use predictive um, models to actually ascertain who the people are who, within the next five to ten years, will end up in jail or be in trouble unless we do something about it. So the whole purpose of the social investment program is to get in early and deal with them at an early age. So the way we are framing policy, as I said earlier, is in three dimensions. We need to worry about prosperity in a material sense. We need to worry about sustainability. And we need to worry about uh, uh, inclusiveness. And it's in the context of inclusiveness that uh, a lot of work is going on. We call it social investment, as I said earlier. And current uh, focus is primarily on the 0 to 12-year-old uh, children uh, who are most vulnerable and putting all our investment effort into those kids, uh, getting in early, investing in them and working with their families to make sure that they don't get into trouble. In addition to, of course, dealing with people who are already in that situation, that's a more distributional aspect, but the focus, the mindset in Wellington is the so-called social investment. We will explore these things around the tables anyway, but if there's any questions you want to ask at a high level right now, I'm very happy to take them. This framework is being used within the Treasury across 12 um, um, uh, teams are using it, education is using it, retirement income policy, uh, defense, how we allocate capital expenditure, uh, how, where do we invest our, the, our very precious dollars in terms of social investment and th this kind of analysis used uh, to get to the 0 to 12 year old kids. Um, where else? There's, um, there, there are about 12 of them uh, the, in terms of the teams within the Treasury. Is it having a direct impact on government right now? Uh, is this framework actually the government's framework? The answer is no. Um, however, maybe I'm hallucinating, but the, the way it works is when you look at the total policy package that is being used, uh, and you look at the fact that there are really three streams of policy. One is dealing with uh, poverty and related matters and social investment a big theme of government policy. The other being regional policy and related matters. The third, thinking long term, being climate and related natural resource matters. And the fourth being economic growth through international connectedness under the business growth agenda. When you look at that total package, it's as if this is the government's Framework. In other words, this is our advice 
and in one way or another it appears to be captured by the package of advice. Uh, are we making equal progress in all these areas? The answer is of course no, but that at least is the way we frame it. So when you look at uh, the long-term policies, for example, in a six months time we will be publishing our next long-term fiscal statement, we call it, it will be a long-term uh, statement for New Zealand, including environmental, economic, and social issues. We are actually, relative to three years ago, where our document was simply long-term fiscal statement, and it was termed for public use as affording our future, now it will be, I don't know what it will, it will be called, but it will certainly have in it a big chapter on a, environmental and natural resource issues, a big chapter on social issues, and a big chapter on economic issues. So the, the direction of travel is right, but I cannot say that this is the government's framework. The biggest challenge we face as advisors to the government is to convince the government, any government, I'm not talking about this government, any government, that in fact Dealing and being concerned about environmental and social issues is not a lack of concern about economic issues. It's the other way around. Unless you deal with economic issues in the context of social and environmental issues, it's not sustainable. If I can get across that, then I will die in peace. <laughs> but that, to me, is the biggest intellectual challenge that we face today. And all my private and public effort is try to do uh, modeling and other work to convince people that unless you deal with these things in an integrated way, the whole thing collapses. Right. That's, the, that's our well-being and, and, and living standards framework. Right. The most beautiful thing about our position uh, in New Zealand and within New Zealand as the Treasury is that our minister being Bill English, constantly reminds us that we have a stewardship role to play in addition to it being advisors to the New Zealand government. As stewards, we can worry about anything we want, and although they may not like it, they will not say anything about it, because that's our stewardship role. So in the last long-term fiscal statement, we actually highlighted aging, and we gave a lot of policy options, in including a increasing the age of retirement, and so on and so forth, it is totally against current government policy, but we were given the voice to do that, right? So the way it works is it takes time. You build the intellectual case, you bring the evidence, you keep piling the evidence, international, domestic and all that, like the analytics and insights team within the Treasury working across the public sector tries to bring all the evidence we have with the new data on the complications and implications of poverty, and then the, the wave takes over and something is done about it. And the democratic process, of course, is at work as well. The problem with democracy in this context is that it actually starts putting pressure after the event. Whereas the framework is useful to say, look, unless you deal with these things, it will blow in your face anyway. The other thing, and final point, I'll shut up, is um, the book that I read that haunts me is the first one I read in 1978 when I, was, I came to New Zealand long before most of you were born. And that was by Professor John Gould, called The Rake's Progress. Whenever a New Zealander says, or a Queensteiner uh, says, you know, this is heaven, it won't happen here, the book says, in good things and bad, New Zealand has followed the world with a 10 to 15 year lag. Mm -hmm. So don't ever be. We are part of a global community, and we have a lot to learn from the global community. And this is absolutely critical. So that's how it works. It doesn't happen overnight, as it were. Okay, bye-bye.